them. I went to over a thousand schools or drama festivals. Uh, we'd work it this way. A rich school would have the money to pay for my airfare, and I'd say, no, don't buy my airfare. Buy me a month-long Greyhound bus pass, and that way I can hit, on the way to you, I can hit 10 schools that couldn't afford to bring me. So I would hit dozens and dozens of schools in a month. Uh, and I did this for one very simple reason. I wished that when I was a kid, somebody like me had come around. So, you know, some professional, not a theoretician, but someone from the real world of theater had come in and told me what it was going to be like. That was a joy. That was the happiest time of my life. Well, I, I loved it. And actually, I actually had a question. You sort of touched upon it. Um, it's, you touched upon it in, in, in your presentation and just now. There must have been a moment where the artists at uh, Cafe Chino and La Mama decided they wanted to make money and become, prof you know, quote unquote, professionals? Well, there's all kinds of people in the world. <laughs> there were people like me to whom I only did theater to be allowed to stay at the Chino. It came to mean a great deal to me, but I would never have done theater, you know. Uh, uh, it was just a way of staying at the Chino and knowing these wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, I think people like Lanford thought, oh, I'll work, I'll learn my craft here and I'll go on and hopefully I'll make money from it. And then there were some of the people I described as coming in later who, they didn't care if they ruined the Chino if it was a springboard to a career. So there were all kinds of things going on. There were an awful lot of people who would never have done theater if there hadn't been for the Chino and who never did it again after Off Off Broadway died. You know, it was, uh, uh, some of you know an actress named Carol Nelson who did a lot of plays for me Off Off Broadway. As soon as I stopped producing, she stopped doing plays. She had been a star, she had fans, she had fan clubs, but it was just something fun to do. It wasn't, you know, a, a crusade with her. And when it stopped being easy, she stopped doing it. So there's all kinds of people. Uh, is that, did I answer your question? Uh, I, guess, I guess my, my question was basically, um, did it feel like there was a divide? Were there factions there oh, yes. when it was the, happening? Uh, the, the divide came when we started getting all the publicity. And some people really didn't like it. Uh, I wasn't crazy about it. I, I was happy the way things were. And other people uh, got really furious. Uh, w when that New York Times picture of me was published, I came into the Chino to say, did y'all see this? And somebody threw a newspaper at me because they said, how did you do that? I said, I didn't do it. They took my picture, they published it. But, and you, I realized, oh, that person wants their picture in the Times. That's very important to them. And, and yes, there, the more outside influence came in, and when grants started coming in and there was money to be had, you really saw the divide. There were people like uh, uh, Tom O'Horgan and, and the La Mama Troupe who used that grant money beautifully. It gave them the leisure time to be even more creative. And there were other people who, the moment they got grant money, started putting on the equivalent of Neil Simon plays so they could make some more money. But it takes all kinds. Yes. Is this working? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have fond memories, of course, of China, of, of, of the whole theater there. And you talk about like how great the lighting was and the things oh. like that. The space was so small. I've got two questions. One, is it fond memories of it being great, or was it oh, really no. with that small space? You can what was unusual about it? And then also, did you have bad plays there as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, fewer than you'd think. The kind of people who came down to do plays for free tended to be very impassioned about what they were doing. And th that, that often would keep the level of work high. Yeah, sure, there's the, the, the odd, stupid play, but that person didn't really get asked back to do another play. So very quickly, there came to be a standard of quality. And I, after a while, you know, there, was, there were playwrights who did five, six plays there. So you know, whole months would be these note, now noted playwrights, and they were gonna bring in good work. I'll tell you a funny story about this whole uh, different kind of people. Uh, the last time I saw Lanford, we were brought to New York to do a TV show. And he and I were standing outside afterwards, and I was just so happy to see him. And I said, uh, I never understood, you know, Lanford had been my roommate. Uh, I got evicted because Lanford didn't pay the, told me he was paying the rent and wasn't, way back in the 60s. Uh, and I said, I never understood what it was I had that allowed me to be among you beautiful people. And Lanford said, with perfect Lanford Wilson timing, you had a job, Bob. 
<laughs> so there were people like that who knowingly took advantage of the enthusiasm of people like me. I didn't mind, I got to be with them. Yes? I just wanted to say something because the question was about the lighting. Yeah, oh yes. But there were maybe five or six lighting instruments at the Cafe Chino. But when I played The Ghost of Christmas Past, I had the candles, the birthday candles on the hat. Every time I moved, a different light would yeah, come up yeah. and hit me as if the candles were doing it. And that was like genius lighting by Johnny Dodd that Bob had mentioned. Pa Paul Foster said that Johnny Dodd should be forbidden to leave the country as a national living art treasure, like they do in Japan. No, you, you'd have to go back and read reviews of shows that Johnny lit to know that we're telling the truth. He, uh, Johnny took jobs doing lights for dance troops and he stole a lot of lights from them. <laughs> he, he'd work cheap in order to steal lights. And there were times uh, when this little five or six lighting pipes would be so covered with lights it looked like they were going to pull down the ceiling. He would, he would paint you as you walked across the stage. Uh, he would, uh, uh, bring up one time he had a raised stage with a plexiglass floor and lights under it and lights above it and he would turn bright lights on above it while he was secretly changing lights under it then lower the lights above it and a totally different effect happened right before your eyes uh, every, I don't know any lighting person who came into that cafe that didn't come in and say I'll carry lights for you if you'll let me study with you to Johnny he was just Johnny was, is always, anytime somebody asks who were the three great artists of Off Off-Broadway, Johnny Dodd is always on the list. Uh, by the way, you notice I, just, I talk about Off Off-Broadway as if it's over. To my mind, Off Off-Broadway ended when a bar called The Old Reliable closed in 1971. Uh, there were a lot of there were great places, a lot of great plays done since, but what we came into as Off Off-Broadway pretty much died with the old reliable. Since then it's grants and rental theaters and uh, th politically thematic seasons. You know, just, it ain't off our Broadway anymore. Yes? Uh, Bob, when uh, I came into the Chino after Joe had died, and yeah. the, first, uh, the first play that I saw was The Clown, which you had made reference to, which to me, in seeing it was like the all-star show of, yeah. Uh, yeah. of off off Broadway, and if you might, if you could like maybe talk about some of the people who were in that and how it came oh. about, and also the other thing I wanted to say is, please, uh, uh, some information on Charles Stanley because that was okay. the first time I worked with a, uh, somebody yeah. I considered a genius. Well, just briefly, the clown. Uh, I have some beautiful. I have some beautiful pictures of the clown here. Uh, I don't know whose idea it was to cast the play with only directors and actors. But Lanford Wilson played the prince. Uh, Bob Heidi played the court chancellor. I played the minister of entertainment. And like that, you know. And Michael Warren Powell, who was a, twink, a tweaker, he could take any material and make anything out of it. Somebody got him 50 or $60 for cheap fabric, and he made those Zigfieldian costumes you saw out of them. Tom Ian bought those costumes from Michael Warren Powell and used them piecemeal in his next 20 shows. Uh, the, the play is a light little fable about a, a, a young boy who comes to the court worshiping all these fine people and winds up disillusioned. And it's a sweet play, but you had all these... Uh, uh, directors and writers who were going to show the actors how acting ought to be done. You had the gorgeous costumes and you had a competition just to see who could out ham who. It was a glorious experience. <laughs> Charles Stanley was one of those creatures created by Off Our Broadway. He was a New Jersey boy. Uh, he was very tall. He always said he looked like a camel. He was very, very tall, very, very skinny. He made a great John the Baptist. and He was covered with coarse hair and yet his sensibility was as delicate as some Mandarin Chinese. And the contrast between this almost goofy, lanky appearance and the grace, he was a dancer, and the grace of body and language that came out of it was riveting and very individual. The nearest I've ever seen to it was Vincent Price, who could achieve a sort of effect when he was young. In fact, I once brought Charles Sandy and Vincent Price together. Vincent Price and uh, 
a Broadway producer tried to pick me and Paul Foster up in a bar, and we said, why not? But we were on our way to a party at Charles Stanley, and we took these two uptown people to a Charles Stanley party, which involved priest robes, a wall covered in crutches, uh, lots of acid, uh, lots of costumes and makeup. And the last thing I remember before I passed out under a table was, uh, well, first I saw Charles Stanley and Vincent Price meet, and they recognized each other instantly. It was like two battleships or you know, two queen's consorts sliding into the same dock and making a handshake of peace. And the last thing I remember, I was passing out under a table, and the apartment was one of those New York apartments where you could go all around four rooms through four doors. Vincent Price and Charles Stanley were leading a parade. I believe Deborah Lee was on Vincent Price's shoulders. And everybody, all these bizarrely hands people were doing, and they were playing over and over again Kate Smith singing God Bless America. <laughs> and apparently they did that for a couple hours till they all turned to butter. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anybody got slept with that night, but I think Vincent Price had a good time anyway. Didn't it? Oh, I went, Charles Stanley, uh, went to what we call today rehab. You know, we, we all got pretty drugged out. Charles went to rehab and then to restore his health, worked on a farm for a summer. And on the bus back home from the farm, uh, a truck hit the bus and killed him. You know, it was nothing, a meaningless death. So I went to his funeral out in Jersey and it was a closed coffin and the priest didn't know Charles and they just told him uh, he, was a farmhand who was killed in a car accident. So he spoke of the, the beauty of outdoor life and the healthy life. <laughs> and I was with a dancer named Hieronimo, and he leaned over and he said, at any minute, the top part of that coffin is going to open, and Charles's arm is going to come out in a red velvet glove <laughs> and strangle that preacher. <laughs> so that's what Charles was like. More? Yeah, I'm in awe of just how many productions there were, how that all got done, and was it scheduled in advance? How, what did someone I have only to do? told you about the ones that I have pictures of. That's what I'm, uh, another there, question, yes. Uh, the, often there was a play a week, although in later times, as, as playwrights developed followings, it got to be more. Uh, sometimes there's a, there is a CD recording of Doric Wilson's play, And He Made a Her from 1961, and you hear Joe introduce it. You can hear Joe's voice. And he also, as part of his introduction, tells you of about five plays that were going to play there for one or two nights or two or three times during that week and the next week. So uh, it's, not all on, it's not all in the newspapers or on any schedule that you can find. Uh, there were lots and lots and lots of plays done. Uh, sometimes they'd be scheduled well ahead. Joe kept a little calendar. And yes, yeah, sometimes they'd be scheduled well ahead. You know, people came in. Other times there'd be nothing on. And Joe would say, oh, we don't have any play for the 23rd. And Harry Katukas would say, I'll conjure something right now. Joe would say, OK, Harry, you get the 23rd. And if Harry didn't come up with it by the 23rd, we'd call and everybody would bring in a five-minute scene. You know, so you had everything from these superb polished productions like Dames at Sea and uh, Moon. Moon was so perfect and polished, all black and white, that the, uh, Bob Heidi's lover, John Gilman, insisted on spraying the floor black between performances. So we had to make the whole audience leave and stand on the sidewalk while the fumes dry. You know, uh, if you had everything from polished performances like that to, well, you know, the drug shows I described, which were just crazed nightmares. Where did you rehearse? Oh, well, I, I told I the gentleman, uh, uh, wherever you could. Uh, sometimes in the theater, uh, before and after shows, sometimes in apartments. Uh, it was a catch and catch can business. Any more? Yes. Um, did you have live music or recorded music? Uh, uh, there was, there were times uh, when there actually were musical performers as the show. You know, an accordionist and a saxophonist or something. Less as time went on and the audience was one for drama. But uh, there was a phonograph at the back that got used a lot. People would you know, select music to be played before and after and during shows. There were very few musical shows, oddly enough. There's that Watt Review and Dames at Sea and Psychedelic Follies and the, uh, the FDR one and you know, God Created Heaven and Earth but Man Created Saturday Night. Uh, those are about the only musicals that I remember, about four of them. 
And it's odd because there were a lot of musical people from Judson Church who loved Joe and hung around. And after hours, somebody would have brought along an electronic piano or something and they'd be singing and dancing and stripping and this and that and, you know. But um, live music was not an important element of Chino, no. Yes, yeah. Everybody should have their own microphone. We all should have our own mic. Um, although you talked about the drug plays and the comic book plays and things like that, it seems to me just from my knowledge of it and from what you've said tonight, there was a, a pretty deep uh, literature reference or historical reference or studied yes. reference in, in a lot yeah. of the plays. And I can't imagine a group of playwrights in a theater today having no. that level of reference. We were what we call the paperback generation. Uh, uh, you know, you're talking about m most of us uh, grew up in the 40s and 50s before we came stumbling into the, you know, the 60s. And we had magazines, we had radio, we had movies, we had paperback books. You know, you could get books at your drugstore that they wouldn't let them put in your local library. You know, uh, you go right to the, to the rack in the drugstore where you, you innocent teenagers went for your ice cream, and there would be Kerouac and Tennessee Williams and Burroughs and uh, G. I. Ginsburg. Uh, so we were pretty hip, and uh, uh, we were also the first generation where that many people went to college. You know, uh, I, I, I did two and a half years of college myself, and uh, nobody in my family had ever dreamed they could afford to go to a college. So we had college libraries, and you know, yeah, we, we were probably, as a generation, maybe not the best educated, but the most book crazy and author crazy, and everybody wanted to be a writer. Uh, uh, Jack Kerouac and, and the Beats, may, and Ernest Hemingway, Norman Mailer, these were tremendously admired people. Gore Vidal was coming up. Did that answer your question? Yeah, we, we'd sit and chat, chat about books in a way that probably young people today can't because they'd, well, but they'd be chatting about TV shows. See, we were before TV. We weren't the TV generation. We were used to the effort of turning a page to get our information. Yes. More? Yes. Uh, did the, uh, Wait. <laughs> did, did Stephen Sondheim participate at all? Uh, oh, Leonard no. Bernstein and, and the Broadway no. uh, crowd that's, that's, support? That, that's quite another world. Uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not surprised. You know, I mean, they, they had their own creative thing going. Uh, most of us had no entree to that sort of uh, commercial world, or a lot of us might have drifted into it. Um, the uh, there were a lot of Broadway people who came down, as I said, uh, especially uh, Jean-Claude Van Natale and Tom Ian, for some reason, acquired the Albie Bar Wilder people, saw everything. John Guare. Uh, yeah, uh, John Guare got discovered there. Uh, 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 the Albie Bar, and Hal Prince and Michael Bennett uh, were big fans of Tom Ian's yeah. and came down to all of it. But uh, only a few people got pulled into that, that rich uptown orbit. Uh, well, for instance, uh, uh, you all know the boys in the band, right? Yes. Well, as you may have noticed, we were doing gay plays at the Chino five or six years before that. And the Albert Bar Barwilder people came down and saw them. They saw Lanford's gay plays. They saw my gay plays. And I don't know why they didn't pick us up. I think maybe boys in the band was full length and ours were one acts. You know, it was a long time before any of us did full length plays. I think it, it might have been as simple as that, that Boys in the Band was full length and therefore they could mount it as a, a commercial evening. Or it might have been that Joe Chino discovered us and they discovered Mark Crowley. You know, producers have egos like anybody else. Yeah. I've, I've always, I always wanted to ask Dick Barr why he didn't at least do Lanford and me. You know, uh, uh, I never got around to it. He was a dear man, unpretentious as hell. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Tell me if I don't answer your question fully. More? Anything? Yes. Uh, wait, let me bring you the mic. <laughs> we should toss it. <laughs> You'll edit all this out, right, David? You had mentioned uh, a video of, uh, that we could purchase. What was the name of that? OK. Uh, did you sign your name? Yes. You, I, OK. I will be sending everybody who gave me their email a list of links uh, of things to see on, online concerning Chino people and a list of books that e exist and DVDs and things. I'll send you the whole list. Uh, it's called Summer Lightning. 
And it's a little weird because it represents the Chino in 1964 when we were all like, you know, headed for 30. But it was done by a senior theater in Oregon. So everybody's really 50 and 60. But it's a sweet, sweet, sweet effect. And it does have much. Well, I told Michael when he sent it to me, I said, this is your 1964 Chino. My 1964 Chino was a hell of drugs and group sex. Your 1964 Chino is like my 1961 Chino. I don't think he was very happy with Eddie. Maybe he felt he missed out on the drugs and group sex. I don't know. <laughs> no, he's a sweet man, too. Uh, yeah, uh, so you'll be getting, if you wrote your name clearly, you'll be getting a lot of links uh, about all this. Yeah. More? How did Bernadette Peters find her way as a, was she 15 or 16? 15. She yeah, how did she find her way into, into that world? Did she just I'm respond sure she to an audition, audition notice? I'm sure she came in audition. <laughs> uh, Bob Dada just, just set up auditions, and uh, he was thrilled the moment he found her, of course. And it was true. Those people are different from you and me. Bernadette stepped into the Chino, and it was like spotlights went on. You know, You've either got that particular quality or you haven't. She was born with it. She was that way at 15. And she had she been...